Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, also a technical consultant for Altium. And today we're gonna give an overview of the auto router in Altium Designer. Now, I know a lot of PCB designers don't like auto routers. I don't really use them either. A lot of the stuff that I work on is RF and sometimes it requires some pretty sensitive design work and an auto router just isn't appropriate for that. If you are thinking of using an auto router, when should you use it? What I'm gonna do is go over some of the best practices and some ideas for when you might consider using an auto router, and we'll look at an example board. All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. So, an auto router, as its name suggests, is supposed to automatically route your board, meaning it should automatically place all the traces between components and, of course, ensure that you still comply with your design rules. Auto routers are kind of a touchy subject. A lot of designers don't use them. I don't use it, and I think a lot of folks that are gonna be watching this video are wondering, why are you doing a video about auto routers? Well, if you're new to PCB design, and you go through your list of tools in your design software, and you see an auto router tool, I think it's tempting to start playing with it. The whole point of this video is to go over what types of signals you should use an auto router for, and how it should fit into the workflow. And what I mean by that is, when should you use it? I wanna go over a few examples and then we can actually give the auto router and Altium Designer a try. And one of the reasons I wanna look at the auto router and Altium Designer is because it has a set of strategies built into it that it tries to use to ensure that you get good routing that complies with all your design rules. I'm inside Altium Designer and I have three projects opened up. So one of them is the uh, interface board that we've been playing with in a couple of other videos. And we're actually gonna do auto routing in this board just as an example. So I've unrouted some of the nets. I wanna show you some examples of when you probably shouldn't use auto routing and I'll tell you why. So first, let's look at an example with an RF board and specifically this board. So this board, as you can see here, if you know what these antennas are, you will know that this is a radar board. And so we have phased arrays here. These nets have a coplanar waveguide routing up on the top layer with blind vias being used uh, as a via fence along the length of the, uh, of the waveguide. This type of routing, uh, not only is it a unique structure, it's not just a simple microstrip or strip line, but also it requires phase matching across all of these lines, and it requires this very carefully spaced via shielding across the entire length of the net. This is not something that an auto router could probably handle very well. The reason for that is, as I just said, number one, it requires a phase matching across all of these different nets, and they also require uh, these curves here in order to place these meanders that you can see here. So the simple length tuning tool that you would normally use for something like a differential pair, or that you would use for one of the nets in a differential pair or a length matched parallel bus, isn't really gonna be appropriate for this type of system. However, you can see here that there's actually quite a few single-ended nets, and then there's quite a few differential nets here. So some of these might be candidates for auto routing after you've already laid out all of these lines here, so these coplanar waveguides going to these antennas. Some of these signals could be considered uh, candidates for auto routing after you lay out some of the more complicated signals in this board. So you can see here, there's a lot of differential pairs because this uses a lot of CSI2 and it uses LVDS. And in this particular case, after you do all of that and you've left some room for some of those other signals, you might be able to get away with auto routing in this particular board. The issue with this board is that most of the signals in this board are RF or they're polygon poor or they are a differential pair. And so because of that, this is probably not the best board to use an auto router in. Let's look at another example, which is just a digital board here. So this digital board is the complement to this RF board, and both of these are reference designs, so you can actually get them from Texas Instruments. But I like to look at these kinds of boards just to show you some examples of when uh, different routing techniques might be appropriate. So in this particular board, you can see we kind of have the same thing here, right? We have these differential pairs going between a large FPGA here and then a board-to-board uh, -board connector. And then we've got a bunch of other single-ended stuff going between uh, this component over here, and then we've got some uh, another board-to-board -board connector over on this side where my mouse is. 
So I think, again, this is another example of where if you're very selective with the nets and the location of those nets in the design, you might find some places where you could get away with using an auto router and you may not have so many issues with a lot of cleanup. In fact, that's one of the big criticisms of auto routers is that they do require a decent amount of cleanup. And then the problem is that the time required to do the cleanup ends up exceeding the time to do the routing by hand. And so of course people just do the routing by hand. So it's understandable. So we've got a few uh, traces here that we've identified. And then as you start to look through these different layers, you can probably find some other nets that are away from this large component that you could then identify as candidates for auto routing. So I think if you're selective and you do decide to use an auto router in your design, that you could identify some groups of nets that you could just select and then say, hey, we're gonna use auto routing on only these nets. Now let's look at our interface board again. So our interface board has some of the same characteristics. We've got multiple differential pairs. We've got them being routed on multiple layers. And then we've got a lot of uh, polygon pour or ground pour uh, in uh, different layers in the PCB. Um, we've also got some thicker traces that are being just used for uh, power. And then we've got a lot of single-ended traces that are going from this connector up to this component on the top layer. And then we've got uh, this, uh, this integrated circuit here that has to support a lot of connections as well. Taking all of this together, you can then again identify some nets in this board where there might be some candidates for auto routing. So I think the takeaway or the moral of the story from this whole discussion is this. If you handle all the really complex routing first, and then if you are very selective about the leftover nets that you could potentially auto route, maybe you could get away with using an auto router if that auto router is implemented with the right strategy. What I'm gonna do now is show you how to set up the auto router for this particular interface board. And we're just gonna test it out and see what happens. And we'll see how good it actually is and how much cleanup is left over. So in some cases, the cleanup that can result can be nets that have failed to route, nets that violate clearances, or nets that leave short circuits. After you do the auto routing, you should run a design rule check to make sure that you catch any of those unrouted nets, clearance violations, and short circuits. To access the auto router in Altium Designer, all we have to do is go up to the route menu, go down to auto route, and then you'll see several options in here uh, for what you wanna select for auto routing. So you can do this by component, you can actually do it by room. Actually, that's a really handy tool because it then limits your auto routing to a specific scope. You can also do it by net or net class. I think that's also very useful. Um, and then you've got some other options here to set up the tool. You can then reset it to the defaults and um, you can then just route everything if you want to. So you can just let it handle the entire board. So it's totally up to you. So let's take a look at all just for a moment. So when you bring up the tool, you'll see here in the top half of the window that there's a routing report that's uh, displayed. And this lists anything that you might need to change in the design in order to ensure that the auto router gets performed successfully. So you can see here that you need to set up some default rules. Um, for example, you need to ensure that there is a width constraint set up. Otherwise, it won't know what width to apply when it's doing the auto routing. Um, you can see that there's a via style constraint that you need to set up. Um, otherwise, if there's no preferred via style, it won't know what type of via to place. So there's a little bit of setup that you need to do ahead of time, but just remember, this is actually the same type of setup that you would need to do in a new project anyways, when you're setting up your board and then you're gonna do routing by hand. The other thing that you can do here is define layer directions. So I think this is actually kind of cool because it allows you to implement an orthogonal routing strategy if that is the topology you decide to use for your board. So just as an example, um, the way that this board is set up currently by default, it's got horizontal routing on the outer layers. Because you can see here, I've got uh, planes in between my two signal layers. What I could do is I could make both of those run vertical. Um, I could also just have them go at an angle if I wanted to, but just for fun, um, I'm gonna set them as vertical and then we'll hit okay. So we could go through all of these different uh, options here for, uh, for these strategies. I won't go too deep into it. Um, you can 
read a little bit more about this uh, in the Altium documentation, and I'll actually link to a blog in the description that outlines a bit more about how all of this works. But now what we're gonna do is, I'm just gonna hit route all, and we're gonna see how this comes out, and we'll see how messy or clean it is, and we'll see what level of cleanup we might have to do. So here we go. Okay, so this didn't take very long. It took a little under a minute for all of these connections. And basically what got uh, auto-routed, um, you probably can't see it on the top layer, but if we look at some of the other layers, we can actually see where some of these routes went. So um, here in SIG2, we can see some of the routing. And here in SIG1, we can see some of the routing. And so what we want to do now is just kind of look around to see what kind of cleanup we need to do. Um, and maybe some of these will make more sense to actually just rip up manually. However, when you're using the tool, you'll notice here in the auto route dialog that there is an option for rip up violations after routing. So if there are any violations, it just deletes them and leaves them for you to do by hand. So that's another convenience thing about this. So one thing you'll notice about this is that it failed to complete two connections in 30 seconds. So there's gonna be a couple of leftover uh, routes that you need to do by hand, of course. As you just kind of scroll through here, you're able to see that it did some things that maybe you wanna actually take a look at and redo manually. So for example, we've already got a violation here. There's a short circuit violation right here with this net. This is again, another reason to then check that box, rip up violations after routing. That way it's gonna automatically remove this and you won't have to go back and manually select all of these uh, uh, trace sections, delete it, and then redo it by hand. As we scroll through here, we can see some other stuff that's a little funny. Um, on this kind, on this uh, section of the trace, you'll see here that it actually just wrapped the trace all the way around, rather than just going, say, from the bottom layer over to this region, and then back down to the third layer to where it can then uh, continue from here and then just continue along the route. So there's a few things that it'll do that are sometimes kind of funny and then might require some manual cleanup. But I think the takeaway is this. Most of these signals, if you just kind of zoom in here, are either control signals, so like this MSS signal or this uh, SOP signal, um, or they're part of a low speed bus. And so those are signals that are gonna be really hard to break anyways. You'd have to actually do something like where you get the clearances very close together or you put in a short circuit in order to break those buses. So because those buses are already difficult to break if you were to route them by hand, I think those are okay candidates for an auto router. Again, if you decide to use an auto router in your project. Um, if there's a high density of these traces, it might have trouble just because there's a lot of clearances that have to be dealt with and sometimes it's difficult to resolve all those clearances with this type of auto router tool. So you can already see here that there's some cleanup that needs to be done and that's generally the case with an auto router. And I think this is a case where if you come up with your own strategy and workflow for using an auto router, you can actually do it successfully in such a way that minimizes the cleanup. Also take advantage of that rip up violations rule at the end that's gonna then show you everything that you need to redo by hand once the auto router completes. Last thing you wanna do, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is just go up here to tools and then click design rule check, and then that's gonna open up the, de the design rule checker window. So this is one reason that you might wanna do the auto routing at the end of your design process. The reason is that you will have ideally solved any of those other design rule violations early, that way, when the auto router completes, the only thing that's gonna be left over is any of those violations that are created due to the auto router. So that's an ideal process to me. I don't do it. Um, I've had people that work for me in the past do it and it turned out okay for a small number of nets. I'm gonna leave it up to you to see if it's gonna work for your designs and in your design process. So what about you? Do you use auto routers in your design? I'd love to know, so just let us know in the comments. I don't use it, I love to hear how other people use it and to actually hear if they found a way to do it successfully that really does minimize the cleanup. All right, that's all we've got, folks. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, leave all your comments and questions in the comments section, and last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.